Here we go. How are you? Very good, man. Very good. That was a bit of a challenge getting that, but I think we're sorted now. Yeah. Oh, everything is fine. Yeah, everything's great. You know, we're here in um in the Netherlands now. You know, um, and then I'm I'm getting on a flight in about about a, in about two hours. I've got to be on a flight, and then uh, we're going back to the UK. Quick, uh, quick interview just before that. No, nah, that's all good. Tell us what what happened from from the beginning, please. Sure, my story started. Um, you know, I when I was a kid, I guess you could say, I, you know, I grew up uh, riding BMX bicycles. And I used to love that and always wanted to race motorbikes. Um, and it took me until I was in my 20s before I, I actually got my first motorbike. Um, and then I started riding and racing and I just fell in love with racing, um, you know, racing enduro bikes and off-road bikes. And, and I heard about this race, the Dakar Rally, and I was like, man, I want to do that race. It just looks incredible. And, and then I made it my goal to race the Dakar. And then I had a, a terrible injury. Um, back in 2007 where at a race there was a big crash and I broke my back, my T8, T9 vertebra and I crushed my spinal cord and I was unconscious and when I came around from being unconscious um, all my teeth were smashed out and I realized I couldn't move my legs and it was really scary and I, and I lay in the dirt for, for three hours that day before I was medevaced out. Um, and ended up at a few different hospitals where they said that uh, I wouldn't walk again. And it was obviously very difficult to accept and, and, and very difficult to come to terms with. But as I lay in that hospital, I thought about that Dakar goal. And I thought, you know, I don't care what happens. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still reach that goal one day. And I was fortunate enough to, um, they, they fused my back with some screws and some plates and things. And then I was fortunate to, to get a little bit of movement, a little bit better, a little bit better, and slowly learn to walk again. And, and, uh, and then I kind of carried on through the years, slowly learning to ride a bike again, and then, then starting to race again, and then you know, being able to qualify for the Dakar, racing in Morocco to, to qualify, and, and then got to the start line of Dakar almost 10 years to the day later after breaking my back. It took me 10 years to get to that start line. But that was just the beginning, <laughs> wow. you know. Once you once you get there, then there were so many challenges over Dakar, but it it really it really kind of uh, hit the, the the ultimate on day 12 or 13, where I was riding along, and I'm I'm I was I was stone lost, you know. <laughs> there was no one behind me. I was I was stone lost in the bike category. And a, a rally car came behind me, and there were deep ruts we were in, you know. These, and so as a biker, you're riding in a deep rut. It's full of fish, fish, so you can't. It's like that fine dust, so you can't see the bottom of the rut. And I'm going along, and you know, not going very fast. Me, you know, maybe, maybe you know, 50 or 60 kilometers an hour. But the cars and the trucks, they just put their wheels in those ruts, and they just floor it, you know. And so my siren goes off on my bike to tell me there's a vehicle behind me. And I turn around to look at this vehicle, and I'm expecting it to be about 200 meters back, but it's like 30 meters behind me. It's doing more than double my speed. And I turn the bike to try to get out the way, but you know when you're in a rut on a motorcycle, you can't, you have to either slow down and get the front wheel out. Um, and I just turned, and, and, and it just the front wheel was just against the side of the rut, not wanting to climb out. And I just separated from the bike and, 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 and like dived off the bike. Um, as the car was right on top of me and the car just went right over and completely destroyed the bike. How is it possible that they, 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 they don't stop? And then he, he stopped about 30 meters and the navigator stood out of the car and he went like this to me and I'm like, no, you know, this bike destroyed, the dust is clearing. I'm thinking, you, what? No, you know. And he just got back in the car and he just went, oh, oh, and off he went. And so I just, I just was stone lost with this bike just completely destroyed, lying in this ditch. And uh, I just dragged the bike out of the ditch and I couldn't believe it. You know, day 12 of 13, after taking 10 years to get there, and now I'm out of this race. And it was just, man, it was just, it was so hard to accept that. And, and I looked at this bike. And I just decided, man, I've got, I got to try to do something. But the handlebars were bent. The triple clamps were bent. 
the the radiator was damaged, the frame of the bike was bent, the front right petrol tank was destroyed, the back petrol tank was destroyed, the um, the right foot peg was completely broken off, you know, at the frame. Yes. The exhaust was completely flattened. So the bike is just destroyed, destroyed, destroyed. And um, and what I did is I, I took the whole exhaust off the bike. I disconnected the petrol tanks that were damaged. I only had the front left with just a few liters in. And I still had 660 kilometers to race that day. And there's no bikers behind me. You know, I'm, I'm stone last. And, uh, and I got the bike working, but without a foot peg, without an exhaust, um, the bars bent like this. <laughs> and, uh, and I just started riding and and I knew I was out the race. There was no ways I could race that distance, you know, on a bike like that. It was just, and I was running out of petrol. Um, the next place that there was a, that there was a, a stop, you know, a checkpoint was 65 kilometers away. So I would have had to, and I only had like two or three liters of fuel. So I was going to run out of fuel before I got there anyway. There was, so it was an impossible situation. And to just ride, knowing you're out the race, you know, you're still in the race. Yes. But it's impossible, you know. And I just said, I'm not going to sit under a tree. I'm not going to press that button. If I go out, I'll go out when I run out of petrol. And then I will push the bike. And when the time eventually finishes, wow. then I'm out. But I'm not out before that. And so I just kept going, kept going. And then the most incredible thing happened. Um, in, the middle of the, in the middle of this, like, desert, there's just a KTM... 450 rally replica, the same bike as mine, just sitting there in the middle of this desert environment. Uh, and I didn't even, I didn't even click at first, you know. I, I see it, I'm like, oh, and, and as I went up, I was like, I could see all the navigation stuff had been, all the tracking equipment had been stripped off the bike. So then I could see that this rider, he's, he's out the race, and this bike, he's waiting for the sweeper truck. And suddenly I realized, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, this changes everything. And so there was there was another three guys that were Argentinian guys on old dirt bikes, just just spectators, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And they helped me, and we we stripped the whole exhaust off the bike. We we siphoned all the petrol out of the bike. We took the the foot peg because it it wasn't the foot peg. It was the it was the cradle that holds the foot peg that was broken. Yeah. So we. To, we had to take off the bolts that goes through the swing arm to get it off, and that was a size 17 spanner. And, and I mean, I don't. Um, I'm carrying, you know, a, sh a little shifting spanner. I'm carrying 13s, 10s, and 8s, and all the sizes for KTM. I'm not carrying a size 17 spanner. And one of those guys has a big shifting spanner. This massive, you know, big shifting spanner on his bike. He brings it over. I couldn't believe it. We try to get this bolt off. It's too tight, we still can't, we take the exhaust, we slide the exhaust over it to give us some extra leverage. We get the we get the bolt off, we get this whole plate. It takes us, you know, it must have taken us at least an hour to, to try to do all of this. Wow. And because of the time I lost fixing the bike the first time, and then the time I'd lost um, riding so slowly through the desert, and now the time I'd lost fixing the bike again, by this point, um, four hours behind the guy who is second last. So I'm just way, way, way at the back. And I still have, you know, 640 or so kilometers to still ride at this point. And so I needed all the, my whole road book is destroyed. My whole tower is destroyed. My ICOs are not working, but we don't have time to, to take all of this. You know, I've got to, I've got to get going now. Um, and so I didn't have any navigation. I just had a, um, the, Odometer, you know, the distance was the only one I could see, and so and my road book is destroyed. So then I just started riding, and I would I tore the road book, and I would take some of the tulips up like this, and I'd tear it off, and I'd read the the tulips, and I'd fold it up and put it in my pocket, <laughs> and then just ride, you know, as much as I could, and then I'd stop, and I'd tear some more tulips out, and I just rode and rode and rode, um, and then it started getting dark. And I was just obviously alone, and I just kept going, kept going, and it was you know nine o'clock at night, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, midnight, still riding, one o'clock in the morning, still riding, two o'clock in the morning, still riding, My and 
at 11 minutes past two, I reached the bivouac. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and sometimes riding at night, you know, because I can't navigate properly, I get to intersections and I'm, I'm shining my lights on the ground looking for the tracks, you know, to see where, which intersection I'm at, trying to match it with the road book and, and, and just, oh, just terrible. But, but yeah, I reached the bivouac. I had one hour of sleep and then I did the 700 kilometers the next day. Um, you know, to, to Buenos Aires on the same bike, they changed one of the petrol tanks and they gave me a road book. That's all they could do in that one hour. And then I rode it that last day and then, and then finished. Did you ever meet the, uh, the driver that passed over your bike? You know, I, I didn't. I didn't. And I've thought about it a lot since. And what happened was um, he obviously went and I was so angry. You know, there was so much anger inside of me because I, I just couldn't believe what he'd done. I was just, ah, it, it, it just really frustrated me, you know? Um, and, and so what I should have, the correct, the correct thing to do is to, when I got in that night, I should have gone to the organizers and filled out a incident report form. You know, this is what happened and everything. But here I am. I arrive at the bivouac. I can sleep for one hour or I can go and fill out some forms and do all of this and do a protest and stuff. Now, I'm here to finish the Dakar. That is why I'm here. You, you know, if I fill out those forms and he gets a penalty or he gets a fine, or, it's not going to change my reality. You know, I need to, I just need to get my one hour of sleep and get to that finish line. And so I didn't, I, I left it, you know, I just left it. And they could easily work out who it was. They would just work out who was there at that time because we all have trackers on the vehicles. Exactly. And so even, if, even at the end of the race, I thought, no, I'm going to tell. And I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter. You know, he knows who he is. And, um, and for me, it's, it's not going to change anything. And so I just need to let go of the anger and just, you know, I finished the race. It, it, at the time, it made me so angry. But when I look back, it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me because it gave me such this, this, this awesome finish to my story and this incredible adventure. And it, and it, and it's, and so if I could go back, I would hope it would all work exactly the same way. And so, wow. so I've, I'm not angry anymore or, you know, it's, it's fine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking, I was scared if I was him, you know, you're, you're a big guy, you know, and just passing <laughs> over. That's why he said to the navigator, you go out. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> you could see angry my face. eyes. <laughs> 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 but the, 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 the story is incredible. It's unbelievable. I mean, I think even God say, okay, let me give you a bike in the middle of the desert because after what you pass through, I mean, it's the minimum that I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that. <laughs> and when I first saw it, it didn't, it didn't register straight away. You, you know, it was, um, I saw it and I was like, oh, riders out, that's terrible. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> and it kind of like took a few seconds, you know. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty crazy, you know. But it, the bike belonged to um, a Colombian rider. And he, he had had a crash and he'd broken his arms. And he'd been taken out in the helicopter. Um, and, and so, um, I, with the guys from Argentina, they couldn't speak English. And they only spoke Spanish. Um, but they said, oh, no, he's broken his arms arms you know they were kind of showing me and, and um and so i understood it a little bit um and then uh when i got back from dakar i, I found because his, his bike number was 101 so i looked up his name on the entry form oh, and, uh, and then i found him on facebook um and then i sent him a message and i said this is what happened you know i took the parts from your bike and he was like oh, that's incredible you know well done and everything and um and then i uh, i I couriered um, all his parts back to his team again afterwards. So he got all his he got all his stuff back. So I'm not I'm not that bad, you know. <laughs> but how how did you get from where you were with your body to the side competing at Dakar? I mean the Dakar. We are not yeah. talking about one one race in general. Yeah. The Dakar. You know, it was just it was really like. 
if I told anyone about this dream to race the Dakar when I was in the wheelchair, people would have said, you're just crazy. You know, you're completely crazy. You know, you'll never do it. It's, you know, it's impossible. And at the time, it was, it was impossible. But it, it, it was a slow process, you know, like I said, it took, uh, it took 10 years. And so you look at, um, it started off just doing the physiotherapy, learning to, to just twitch my toe and then my ankle, you know, a little bit, and then started to learn to walk again. And it was, it took me two and a half years before I, I sat on a motorcycle and rode a motorcycle for the first time. So it was two and a half years just to get back on the motorcycle. Then it took me um, close to, uh, I'm just trying to think now more or less, about another 18 months before I entered my first race, you know. So it was four years almost from breaking the back before I was on that start line of just a local little enduro race again. Um, and, and then it took me, um, then, it, then I started to build up to, and, and that first race, I was time barred. I did one lap. Some guys did six laps that day. I did one lap. I was time barred. It was a mess. Um, but then I started to finish races and slowly but surely I started to now, um, to finish. And then I, and then I entered a multiple day race and then I, and then I finished a multiple day race and, and then it started to build and, and it took me seven years to get to the point where I could now finish multiple day races. And then I was racing up along the border of Swaziland and um, Mozambique. Yeah. yeah. And I hit a cow. Just going through the bush and this cow came out and I just went straight into the cow. And, wow. I, and it was quite remote. And so I, I lay there in the bush felt um, for about three hours. Um, and then I was transported to the hospital and I'd separated my collarbone from my shoulder. Oh, and yeah. I, I'd uh, broken the back of my of my elbow and my triceps had ripped off the elbow and I'd broken some ribs off and I'd torn my forearm down you know to the bone yeah you know so the bones were you could see the bones and things and it was just it was terrible and that was that was six months of healing again um, and so you're working hard for seven years to to get to this goal and then you have this big accident and you're back in hospital I had to have two operations and um, they've put a, a plate and a screw in my elbow um, to attach the triceps again and it was six months of wearing the cast and healing and that was 2014 and it was just, it was so difficult, you, you know, and I thought, you know, maybe I must, I must stop chasing my goal, you know, I'm chasing this goal, and I'm going to die, you know, I, I got to, I need to like, you know, just get right and then Nothing. I did a Nothing. trip. I just did a trip on my own. I had a 450 and I rode through Lesotho and I rode all the way through the Drakensberg Mountains down to Cape Town. It, it was five days and um, 2,600 kilometers on a, on a 450 just on my own with my, with my bags on the back. And however far I got, I just slept. Um, and, and it just gave me a chance to like think about things. And I thought, I don't want to be that guy that one day lies on my deathbed. And goes, man, I should have, I should have done more. I should have, uh, you know. And I decided that, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't understand my goal. I know a lot of people don't understand um, my dream and why it's important to me. But it's, it's, it's my goal. It's my dream, and it's and it's my life. And and I'm still gonna do the Dakar. And so I came back from that, and I was like, no. And I got and I got fit again. I got strong again. I got my arms strong again. And I. And I went again, and then um, and then it took me another three years, you know, from that to to get to that Dakar start line, and then and then to finish the Dakar. So it was um, it, it it was an impossible dream, but when you break it up into these little goals every year, every year, and you just tick 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 tick, suddenly, or well, it's not suddenly, but ten years later, you find yourself on the start line of the Dakar rally, and you think like. I don't know, you know, it seems crazy to get here, but just, we're just a little bit every year, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, and suddenly it's within reach. And, and nothing can stop you, and nothing, 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 not a cow, not a truck passing over your bike, nothing. 
<laughs> KTM, how did you met them and uh, decided to, to go with them? Um, I'm not a pro rider or something, you know. You know, when I when I when I had this goal, you know, and I and I spoke to some of the people in South Africa about it, and they, you know, I I've, I'd raced KTM's for a few years just because I I, I like the brand, and then yeah. um, and then when I did my fundraisers, um, I started because I didn't have the money to do Dakar. That was the other thing. I didn't have enough money. Um, I had enough money to go to Morocco to qualify, but I, I didn't have money for Dakar. I had I didn't have anything for that. And so I had to raise the whole amount. And so we did lots and lots of fundraisers. We did an enduro bike race. We did adventure bike rides. We, we sold caps and t-shirts and we did fundraising evenings and we did raffles and we did just almost anything we could think of, you know. Um, and KTM, uh, they sponsored me a lot of prizes for my events. You know, they gave me some prizes and things. And then, um, and then as this, this, this dream started growing and people started hearing about it and they're like, and, and I also said that anybody who donates anything, it can be, uh, you know, 10 Rand or 10,000 Rand, um, we will put the name on the motorcycle. And so I had more than 320 names, um, you know, on the, on the bike from all people and, and KTM, then they said, and they gave me some money. Um, and then they gave me a check, you know, a big check with some with some money in. Um, and then they, uh, it was fifty thousand rand, which is a lot um, in South Africa. That then they said they would sponsor me all of my spares for Dakar. So so then it was uh, all the spares, you know, the, the the sprockets and the chains and the you know all things as well as my kit, you know, so gloves and boots and and pants and all that, which was a big a big big help. Um, yeah. And and so they were they were really good to me, and they they helped me with all my fundraising things, you know, supporting me and you know with prizes and you know a, attending it and things. And then when I got back from Dakar, they paid for all the spares to fix that rally bike back to back to 100 percent, and that was that was that cost more than 50 percent of the value of the bike. It was it was a lot. It was a lot to fix that bike. They've been they've been very very good to me. They really have, you know. And it's so nice because it's it's such a, you know, I've I've always been a big KTM fan. You, you, you know what I mean? I, I love the motorcycle. I love the brand. Um, and so to have them back me, um, is 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 a dream come true. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How? How is the Dakar seen from your eyes? I mean, where, when finally you were there, yeah, and you realize that I'm gonna start the Dakar. It was, it was more, you know, to be there. The, the beauty of the Dakar, in my opinion, the biggest beauty is that I get to ride right next to my heroes. You know, right next to these top pro riders. So you can imagine if you're a Formula One fan or whatever to be on the starting grid with all your heroes, you know, and, and Dakar gives you that opportunity. I can't race other races against, you know, top guys like Sam Sunderland and Toby Price and these kind of guys. Um, but to be on that start line with these guys after being paralyzed 10 years ago and suddenly you're here was just, it was a, it was like a childhood dream, you know, it was just incredible. Um, and so that, that for me was the big thing. And then people want photos with you and they want your signature and it was like, I'd never experienced that before. And it was just a, it was like this crazy parallel universe, you know. <laughs> there was plenty of times I wanted to give up, there really was. And when that car went over the bike, I was so angry and disappointed. But there was also like this little bit inside of you that says, ah, oh, it's over now, you're finished, you don't have to worry. You have a good reason to go home. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. You, you, it's fine, you know. But you're like, ah, it's just not a finish, though. It's not a finish, you know. <laughs> it can be a good reason for a normal one, normal person, not for you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I can see you walking with the bike over like this. I say, I don't give up. I don't give up. Don't give up. Mind, whatever it took, whatever it took. And and the truth is, if you if if anybody ever wants to do the Dakar rally or those kind of things. You have to have that attitude. You have to have the attitude of, we are here to finish. Whatever it takes, 
we're here to finish because you will reach your you will reach your point within the first four or five days you will reach that point where where you should quit you know, you know there's there is plenty reasonable reasons to quit plenty if you're looking for a reason you'll find it in the first three or four days you'll find your reason that, that it's 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 too dangerous it's too difficult it's too irresponsible or there's always a reason but it's uh it's not enough you know i've got to grab this flight um can I um uh, I will be back in 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 England at about uh, at about two o'clock. Okay. Could I, I can I contact you again uh, then? Yes, absolutely. Um, is that okay? Don't miss the flight. <laughs> okay. Well, I will contact you later today. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, uh, thank you. Have a safe flight. Bye bye. Okay. Get it. Wow. Cheers. Um, we're talking about the preparation for the Dakar. I mean, you competed in the 2017 edition, which for many reasons was one of the hardest since they moved to South America. So how did you train uh, for the Dakar and how, if the altitude influenced your performance? I was quite fortunate, if, if I can be honest. Um, I, had, I had some headaches um, with the altitude and I had... Um, and I and I felt I woke up a few times in Bolivia where in, you wake up in the night with just a, a, a big headache and it feels like someone's sitting on your chest. Where I did notice the altitude was was on the switchbacks going up the mountains because the bikes also lack a bit of power. So you come around a switchback and they're really tight switchbacks and you're turning very tight and you're giving it enough power to stay up. But it's like, whoa, and you're like, ah, and once it starts tipping, you know, I can't hold the bike up. So I dropped the bike a few times. And it was, it, would, it was a three-step plan to pick up the bike. So first of all, when you drop the bike, you stand up and then you get your breath back. Then you lift the bike up and you get your knee under it. And then you stand and you get your breath back because you start seeing the, the spots and it starts spinning. And then, and then you get your breath. You know, then you stand the bike up, get your breath back again, climb on, get the breath back again, and then you go riding again. And so it was very much... a. It was just such a process. And then every corner after that, I would make sure I was sitting down. My foot was out like you would do a motocross corner, not just standing, you know. I'd get that foot out and I'd make sure I was, you know, giving the bike plenty power to swing me around the corners. Um, so that was the one time that I, that I struggled a bit. And at, we're getting high at altitude. I would stand up on the bike just to open things up. And I'd focus on really just breathing deep and, you know, trying to just get those oxygen levels deep and rapid and just, you know, like that. And, and I, was, I was quite fortunate that I, I never suffered, you know, any serious, I should say, or very serious, um, you know, altitude problems. I can't, I can't run. You know, I can do a little bit of a funny jog over a short distance, but my legs aren't strong enough for me to run. So um, in the gym, I would row a lot. And I would do uh, the Orbi trick. So it's the one with the hands like this, um, and then the feet move like this. You know, like I guess yeah. like a skiing sort of motion. Yeah, that's it. So I used to. I did a. I did a. That was how I would do my cardio and swimming. People think of a spinal cord injury. You you lose the use of your legs, and so my legs are are, are very weak. You know, I have I have permanent damage where they'll never be. They'll never be a hundred percent. But it's also your core. That you that you that you use you know around your waist and so sitting on a bike is very difficult it is harder for me it's actually easier for me to stand but but luckily that is the better way to ride when you're racing off road is to stand up so I I tend to stand a lot you know I stand probably even more than most guys would stand you know the that car is um, it's a race where probably you stay longer with yourself in the hardest environment. Yeah, you, 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 your thoughts, I mean, you have so much time to reflect on things, so much time to reflect on, um, you know, you, it, it, I guess the best way I could say it is that it pulls out any doubt, any, it really like just, just lays you bare, you know. If, if you're going there with any second guesses, if you're going there, um, not 100% committed in your mind. Um, you know, by day three, it all comes out. There's times where you, where you, where you just find yourself. You know, your, your, the tears just start coming. You start just welling up in your goggles, um, because you are so tired. You are so um, physically finished. 
you, you know that you have so much more ahead of you than you've conquered. You know, you're not even, you're on like day four or something. You, you know, there's so much still to go. It's not like you're at the end and it's, uh, you, 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 and you're thinking, I can't, there's no ways, you, you know. Um, and so it brings out all that sort of stuff in you and you and you start guessing your motives for being there. You start, you know, everything just kind of like, and you've got to like, you got to get all this information and you got to put it in the right files and, you know, just keep that head straight, man, because it can, it, it can run away with you very quickly. I can tell you from, from a physical point of view, when I was at the end of day three, yeah. at the end of day three, physically I felt like I expected to feel at the end of Dakar. So, so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, how tough this will be, what it will involve, by the end of day three, I was at that point, and, and and you realize like, whoa, you know, I have a good I have a good milestone, you know, for for what's what's a tough race, but just being there, just the 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 hours because you you know the riders leave at four o'clock in the morning, they start leaving at four, so you're waking up at three. Now, if you're only arriving in at nine o'clock at night, you know, you're not getting in into bed before before eleven. So you're getting these like four hours of sleep. Now, suddenly you've done this and now it's the third day in a row of this kind of stuff. Um, you're just done. You're just done. And it's and then when you, you're tired, you make navigational errors, you, you crash, um, stupid crashes. You know, I, I would see guys on TV watching the Dakar and you see a guy in the dunes and he drops his bike and he like picks it up and it's difficult and then he goes a bit and drops again, and I'm like, oh, just twist the throttle, man, go, what are you doing? And suddenly when you're there, and you are so physically tired, and you're so mentally tired, you're making all these same dumb mistakes, as you're just so physically and mentally fatigued, that you just do dumb things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you were not the only South African, we knew that uh, it was your friend, uh, Walter Farbanch, yeah. that... Uh, didn't finish the race. Yeah. So he, instead of uh, going back home, he stayed there and helped you. Man, can I tell you, he, he, he was really incredible. And, you know, you hear about the camaraderie on the Dakar, and there is a lot of camaraderie in between teams, in between manufacturers. It's, uh, there's a lot of, like, you know, special camaraderie. But it is, it is a race, and guys are there to race, and, and you have to – Sometimes, you know, not help other people because it, it's going to, I, I guess it's like the, the death zone um, on Everest. You, you know, you want to help others, you want to bring them down, but you're going to end up, you know, killing yourself there. And with that car, you're going to end up not finishing the race yourself. So you, the guy, you have to be very careful about where you help, where you don't help. When you go out the race, it is hard. It, it is. And, and, you know, as, a, as somebody who it's, who have, who have sacrificed so much to be there, the thought of going out is like, oh, it, it's just such a tough, bitter pill to swallow. And so for him to do that, and then he came back, and it took him two days to catch back up to the race. He had to take a taxi right through the night, and, you know, it was an incredible thing that he did. And he did all of this, um, and, and he caught back up to the race. And when he caught up to the race, you know, he was, it was hard for him, you know, and, and I hugged him and I was like, I'm so sorry, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm really, and, and it was difficult times and we, we both, you know, shed a bit of a tear because, you know, you have the shared dream and things and, and it was tough. But um, I said to him, I said, you know, because it was just before La Paz, just before the rest day. And so I said, get a flight from La Paz go to Buenos Aires, you know, his girlfriend's coming over from South Africa, yeah. go and have a one-week holiday in Buenos Aires. You, you, you know what I mean? It's a beautiful place. You know, get your mind away from Dakar, yeah. you know, enjoy some time with your, with your, with your girlfriend and, and just, you know, have a, have, have a, you know, get away from it, get things sorted. And he thought about it a bit and he said, nah, he's going to stay with the team. And uh, that day that I was hit by the, by the car and the car went over the bike, I arrived at 11 minutes past two in the morning. At the gate of the bivouac, Walter was standing there waiting for me 
at 11 minutes past two in the morning. Above his head like this, you know, it was just incredible. And but I pulled up at the gate and he climbed on the back. Um, and I said to him, I said, hey, man, you got to keep your feet down because <laughs> I can't stop. I'm going to fall over here. And, we, and then he directed me to our team. And you'll see on the Red Bull, um, on Red Bull TV, they, they had a video where I pull up at the crew and you see Walter climbing off the back of my bike. And, and that night he then helped the mechanics and he marked my road book for me while I had that one hour of sleep. So the next morning when I got on the bike, my road book's marked. The changes are made. Um, if he wasn't there, I wouldn't have had that that one hour. And and he helped me. He mixed he mixed up my Camelback, you know, all the all the juice in my in my tripper, and and just you know he had it all ready for me, my jacket ready, uh, so I could get that one hour of sleep. Which which that one hour of sleep it sounds like like nothing, but that without that that one hour, there is no ways I would have finished. You know, having had back to back to back days, I couldn't do a a 48 hour at that point, you know. In 2015, yes. I yes. was racing in Amagheza Rally and I came across a rider that had had a massive crash and he was unconscious and he was lying in the bushes with all blood coming out of his face and things and the medics had got there before me and they had uh, now got him onto the stretcher and stuff and I stopped and I helped to carry this guy and I helped to put him into the back of the ambulance and things. We realized, we realized only much later, that was Walter. Oh, wow. How crazy is that? How so, crazy. I him in an ambulance, you know, three years ago or two years before Dakar. And suddenly at Dakar at, at 10, you know, 11 minutes past two in the morning, he's waiting for me to come back. So it's quite a cool story in, in all of that as well, you know. Dakar consumes you, you know, it can consume your life, it can consume finances, it can consume everything. And, um, you know, you have to find the balance. As much as Dakar is a, is a big thing for me, it's a big thing for a lot of guys, it's just a bike race. It really is just a bike race. Will you compete back? Man, I get asked that a lot. <laughs> when I when I finished Dakar, I was like, never, ever, ever, you, you know, just man, that, that was a Dakar. That danger's there, whether you like it or not. It's from other guys, cars, trucks. You know, in the dunes, it's all blind riders. You can't see who's coming over where. It's it's a crazy, crazy thing. And I was like, man, you know, to get out of this alive, um, just take it, and I'm like, we're done. But with the talk of it coming, you know, possibly to Africa again, if it comes to South Africa, man, I think I got to do one more. If it's in my home country, you know, if it's if it's in your home country, you got to you got to you got to go. That's it. <laughs> but I won't go back to South America. You are now doing a, um, a motivational speaking conference around the world. So how people can get hold of you, follow you? Yeah, the best is through my website, which is joeyevans.co.za. So joeyevans.co.za. Um, and, and you know, there's a little form there and they can send me an email and then I'll reply and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I do a lot of uh, talking for, for conferences, you know, for businesses and stuff, you know, who are looking for, um, you know, an inspirational type speaker. My new goal now and things is to try and, uh, try and speak all over the world. And, and when I go to these places, I'm, I'm trying to organize a, a ride as well, you know, so to go riding in these places. So if I can do these talks and I get to ride a motorcycle all over the world, I think that that's about as, as good as it gets. I want to thank you so much for your time. And it has been really a privilege interviewing you. It's a pleasure. You for your time. No, any, any time, really, any, any time. And I'll definitely give you a shout when we, uh, when we work our way around to Italy. You know, we'll have, to, we'll have to definitely give you a shout. I'd love to come and visit you guys there. Thank you very much. We keep in touch. Cool.
kilometers without an exhaust through the bush trying to stay out of the way and I've just come across a bike right here where the rider's being evacuated he's obviously injured so I'm just gonna take everything off his bike that I need put it onto mine and just continue there's nothing else I can do and then obviously tonight I'm gonna explain to the guy and stuff but he's been evacuated so he's out the race but uh, we're just gonna quickly cannibalize what we can freaking insane but it shows you you don't quit ever.